Great. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to this event tonight. The, it's called Hassan Diab Extradition Law and Trial. I'm really happy to see so many. When you set up an empty room and you don't know if it will fill, it's a moment of trepidation. So this really is wonderful. It's an important uh, evening, an important event. Um, I'm also happy to see so many faculty members here. Uh, Hassan is our colleague who is taught here, who is taught at the University of Ottawa. And uh, I think we have an obligation to take an interest in his case. Let me just quickly, uh, before I do that, I have in my notes here, if you see on this board over here, uh, the website for PRISM TV. This is being filmed this evening, so you're welcome to find it again to uh, tell others about this talk and uh, point out where they can find it. So if you take that down, you can pass that news along. Just a little background information. Some of you have already uh, seen this. It's something I sent to some of uh, the students I, I teach. I said, Hassan Diab is a Canadian sociology professor who has taught at Carleton University and the University of Ottawa. On November 13, 2008, uh, Dr. Diab was arrested by the RCMP at the behest of the French government, which claims he participated in the October 30, 1980 bombing outside of the Rue Copernic Synagogue in Paris, which killed four people and wounded many others, around 40. While fighting uh, the French extradition request since then, uh, Dr. Diab has endured two separate times in jail for a total of about five months, uh, onerous bail conditions upon release. In fact, one of those is he has to be home at a certain time. Hassan is with us tonight over there. Uh, he has to leave by a certain point. He's here with a surety. Um, so he will stay afterwards if people would like to talk to him but he has to leave by 9.30, I believe, is roughly the time. Those are one of the bail conditions. He's wearing a G, uh, one of these GPS kind of bracelets to track his movements, uh, this kind of thing. Costs about $2,000 a month, I understand. Uh, anyway, he also was dismissed by, from his employment uh, at this university uh, where he was teaching an introductory sociology course. On June 6th, uh, Justice Robert Mirage uh, ruled that Dr. Diab be committed for extradition to France. Uh, he has appealed this ruling. In committing Dr. Diab to extradition, Justice Mirage noted that the French presented a weak case and that, quote, the prospects of conviction in the context of a fair trial uh, seem unlikely. Prior to introducing our panelists, I'd like to just set you know, some basic ground rules. So I said we'll try to finish around 9 p.m. Uh, Hassan will stay a little longer just to speak with people individually. Uh, each of our panelists, who I'll introduce in a moment, will speak uh, one after the other. And then following that, there will be a discussion period with the panelists and the audience. So I hope you have lots of questions to put to them. When you're posing your questions, if you could indicate which panelist they're for, or if it's for both or either, you could say that. And please keep your introductory comments fairly brief. Um, just, you know, not to go on and on and on, you know, I'll get to the question if you do that. Uh, I will try to keep a speaker's list. I'll try to notice people's hands. I, I hope I don't miss anybody. If it so happens that, uh, and it happens in classes all the time, some people want to ask question after question, which is wonderful. But I also will try to get other people in if they haven't spoken yet, just so you know, I'm not trying to ignore you or and not appreciating your, your involvement. Uh, what else? Um, oh yes, we always say that these things, if you have a cell phone, please turn off the ringer, put it on silent, unless it's absolutely uh, necessary that the ringer be on. I don't know what reason it would be, uh, maybe surgeons or somebody, but you can put that on vibrator anyway. Or if you have a great ringtone, you can leave it on and we'll all, we'll all enjoy what happens. Okay, um, I will introduce uh, tonight's panelists in the order in which they will be speaking and I will read uh, something, a little bit, of their biography so you have a sense of their background. To my immediate left is Donald Bain. He is Hassan's uh, lawyer. He's a partner with Bain Seller Boxall. He received his uh, LLB, uh, his Bachelor of Laws from Queen's University, a Master of Laws from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and an MBA from Queen's University. Uh, Donald has practiced criminal law exclusively for the last 36 years, roughly more, almost 40, almost 40 years. Uh, he has been designated a specialist in criminal litigation by the Law Society, has conducted trial 
and appellate advocacy at all levels of courts in Canada and at public inquiries, including uh, the Somalia Inquiry, the Arar Inquiry, the Yakabuchi Inquiry. He has defended all manner of criminal charges, including murder, complicated conspiracies, war crime cases in Canada, the Soviet Union, the Ukraine, and charges against uh, corporations. Uh, he has also taught at the Faculty of Law at Queen's University. He's on the board of, are you still on the board of trustees at no. Queen's? But you were on the board of trustees at Queen's. Uh, you've taught before the, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada education program for visiting judges, and I could go on and on, but we, Don just flew in from uh, Vancouver early this morning, and I, he might fall asleep as, I, as I'm uh, <laughs> listing his accomplishments. Uh, to his left is uh, Natalie De Rosier. Uh, she is currently the General Counsel for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Previously, she was a University of Ottawa uh, Vice President, President for Governance. Uh, she was Dean of the Civil Law Section at the University of Ottawa, President of the Federation of Social Sciences and Humanities. Uh, she's a past President of the Law Commission of Canada. And she was also for what, about 13 years on the Faculty of Law at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario. So I think that's uh, probably enough uh, introduction uh, of our guests, but before they speak, Peter goes, where is Peter? Uh, they're back here. Peter is the chair of the Sociology and Anthropology Department. Uh, his department, along with the Law Department, along with this department up here, Interdisciplinary Studies, is sponsoring this event. Uh, Peter will just say a few words of how people can get involved, how they can support uh, this initiative. We didn't want to leave it to the very end in case some people have left before that information is conveyed. Thank Thanks, you. Bill. Um, very briefly then, I think you will have all got uh, pamphlets and there's a um, website, uh, uh, Justice for Hassan Diab on that, where you can get more information. We are always looking for people to get involved. So if you are moved by what you hear tonight um, and feel that you would like to support Dr. Diab, in his uh, fight against extradition here. There's a couple things you can do. We have a uh, sign-up sheet there for the uh, support committee um, on which many people in this room are active. Um, and Bill also is trying to organize an OPERG uh, interest group here um, of students. So students uh, in particular uh, who might feel um, like getting involved, we would really appreciate that. Um, he is one of ours, as Bill said, so it's important that there be local support. Um, faculty and students, so we're always trying to do that. Um, and that's basically it. We, we're available to talk afterwards as well. Yeah, just one point to add for students, if you are interested, uh, please see me after. Oberg has said, you know, they have a space and the possibilities to support such a campaign, but it takes the involvement of students doing the work, and, and your work would be greatly, uh, your commitment to appreciate it. All right, thank you, Peter. And now we'll have our two speakers. Uh, we'll begin with Donald Bain, please. I'd like to thank you for having me here on behalf of Hassan and Rania, and I see some familiar faces who uh, have heard uh, a good deal of what I have to say or <coughs> watched the case <coughs> in the courts, so forgive me for going into detail you already know, but what I propose to do is give you a little history of this case, discuss <coughs> some of the issues uh, that make it unique and important in Canadian law, Canadian justice, Canadian extradition law, and raise some issues of ultimate fair trial um, for you to think about. So first to give you the history so in your mind you can locate what I'm talking about. As you've heard, Hassan was arrested uh, in Ottawa here November 13, 2008. He was thereafter in custody and a, a basically a botched bail hearing was held for him uh, by uh, a lawyer from another town who really didn't um, consult very much with Hassan and uh, Hassan couldn't understand the proceedings um, and he was detained. He, would, he really couldn't meaningfully participate. Everything was in French. Uh, and the lawyer told him not to worry about that, he would handle everything. He was detained. Uh, the Ontario Court of Appeal, uh, Rania came to see me, uh, told me a little about the case. Uh, I got on it thinking I'd maybe have a year uh, involvement in this and we're ending our third 
full year on this matter. Um, we got him a new bail hearing. We got that first bail hearing quashed. We had to go to the Court of Appeal to do that. That was in February, so from November to the end of February, he was in rather hopeless straits out at the jail here. He was ultimately then at the new bail hearing where he could really meaningfully participate, released on March 31st, 2009. He was released on strict and very uh, costly and unusual conditions because of, France tried to paint a picture of a man who was part of an international terrorist conspiracy and could be spirited out of the country and had all sorts of international terrorist connections, none of which is or was true. Uh, Hassan has to pay, unusually, for his own monitoring. The GPS you saw, he wears an electronic anklet as well. There are many, many sureties, uh, but at least he was admitted to bail so we could carry on the fight. The case that France brought against him and the way that extradition law works is that the, the, the requesting country, whatever country, in this case France, doesn't have to have any sworn evidence to put before the Canadian court. They just need a summary from a government official, usually a prosecutorial official in the, in the foreign country, claiming certain things, writing up a summary or rendition of the, of the, of the evidence. In this case, the case against Hassan is based, one, on intelligence, not evidence, secret, anonymous, unsourced, uncircumstanced intelligence. And secondly, from the start, it was based on two handwriting opinions. Uh, there are five printed words that one of the people that the evidence indicates was involved in this bombing printed on a hotel registration card. And they are the words Panadriu, surname, Alexander, first name, Larnica, Cyprus, technician, and they're printed in block letters. It's not script writing, it's not cursive writing, and um, they, uh, the French had uh, commissioned two uh, people, I don't know how many people they went to first and told them that you can't make a handwriting comparison of cursive writing to this block printing, but they did find two alleged experts uh, to say, one of them, this was the writing of Hassan Diab. They purported to take Hassan's PhD uh, work at uh, Syracuse <coughs> University and compare it. The problem that emerged was they actually took half of the documents they took were of his wife. And so what these two supposed French experts were really doing was, through the handwriting, identifying Hassan's wife as the 40 to 45 year old man who signed in at the hotel. Now the French claimed that these were, these, this was impeccable evidence. We were given an opportunity to, by the judge presiding here, to refute this, to prepare. Um, I went to England, the US, Lebanon, southern Lebanon along the Israeli border. We were in Palestinian refugee camps. We met people. Um, handwriting experts, the chief expert in Britain, the chief expert in the United States, and the chief experts in Canada, and we assembled a response to this record of the case that the French had produced. Our expert evidence revealed, our handwriting evidence, the folly of this supposed expert opinion that the French relied on. And it was not just a case of a minor error. This was, this was glaring unreliability. It was shocking. And uh, embarrassed, France immediately asked for an adjournment of the hearing which was upcoming, uh, stalled for months and months and months, then announced they were going to disavow entirely these two first supposed experts and their opinions and replace <coughs> them with yet another uh, so-called French expert. So that happened. And a new French expert was produced. Again, no one knows how many people they went to, actual experts who said 
either this is not the same handwriting as all the experts we went to said, and they are the world's leading experts, but this new French handwriting turned out to be equally unreliable as the others. In addition to that, and we were permitted to call that, um, Kent Roach and a number of other, Kent Roach is a professor at U of T, he's probably Canada's leading academic on the difference between intelligence and evidence. Uh, but a number of Canadian intelligence experts, Wesley Wark, Tom Quiggan, uh, a British expert uh, on the French legal system, Professor Jacqueline Hodgson from the University of Warwick, and materials that we gathered from the UK Home Office, from Human Rights Watch, from the eminent jurist panel of the International uh, jurists, a uh, convention of jurists, and many other groups had done studies of the French terrorist trial, which uses intelligence as if it was evidence. The accused person can't possibly answer it. It amounts to this, that the DST, the internal French intelligence service, claims it has received from an unnamed foreign agency information that Mr. X or Ms. Y did this offense. And <coughs> that person is then compelled to defend against that kind of faceless, uncircumstanced allegation. Uh, Professor Roach gave evidence that uh, during this extradition hearing that intelligence can never safely be used as evidence uh, and Canadian judge clearly was going to exclude all this evidence when France again stood up in these proceedings and disavowed all of the intelligence in the case, making Hassan's case come down to the one replacement handwriting person in France. Uh, you should know, however, France hasn't disavowed any of all of this clearly unreliable material for use in France if and when they can get Hassan to France. They will use this intelligence as evidence. They will use these first two so-called experts who used materials from another human being uh, in conjunction with the third expert. Now, I'm giving you a very abridged history, but as I say, it's kind of important to understand. The judge in ruling that he was going to commit Hassan Diab did it, I guess you'd say reluctantly, um, because he felt there really was, a, as you heard, a weak case. He said, assuming in any fair trial, there can't be a conviction here. Uh, but uh, he, he considered himself so limited as an extradition judge that he could not use the evidence of the international experts to find this replacement handwriting uh, evidence manifestly unreliable, which is the, the magic phrase in Canada for kicking evidence out for consideration for extradition. The judge found, and these are expressions he used, that the defense evidence on this handwriting, this replacement, trashed the opinion of this replacement expert. He found the defense evidence substantially undermined the entire opinion. That the opinion was extremely uh, problematic and confusing. That the conclusions reached by this uh, person in France were suspect. And as you heard, uh, there couldn't possibly be a conviction assuming a fair trial. But again, he committed because of his, what we say is, legal error in uh, too narrowly understanding his jurisdiction as an extradition judge. So that's, that's kind of the, the short Reader's Digest version of the last three years. Um, the specific legal and evidentiary issues raised by the case are the, among them are the following. When, if at all, can, and there's a move to do this in the world, in the, in the, in the post 9-11 hysteria uh, and inflated sort of concerns about terrorism, uh, 
governments have lurched so far to create tools to, in this war on terror that intelligence is actually in active use as evidence in a great democracy like France and without much question or challenge. Um, so to what extent, if at all, can intelligence ever be used as evidence? It never has been in a Western system, as we saw France decided to play a tactical game here, knowing it would lose if it left this in the record of the case, chose to disavow it and hang everything on this slender thread of the handwriting. The problem with intelligence as evidence is you, any accused person is in, faced with not knowing the source, not knowing the circumstances, and therefore we risk using evidence from dubious sources, including tortured material. If you don't know the circumstances that these foreign services are claiming to extract information from people, you don't, you, there's no reasonable assurance this isn't tortured material. Uh, the use of intelligence raises really grand questions of the sense of justice, the treatment of other human beings, the ability to know the case against you, the ability to make a defense against it. If it's all secret intelligence mutterings and opinions, and I mean the classic example that's used is, is weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, when I mean, we all now have a sense of how reliable or unreliable is intelligence. Um, so that is a major issue in this case. You can't know it, you can't defend it, it's, it, it leads to unfair trials, and yet they rely on this in France. And that's the, that's the terrible injustice to this man, that on this doubtful thread of handwriting, what the judge called a pseudoscience, <coughs> Hassan is threatened with being sent to France where he will face material he can't possibly answer. And it will be considered in France a fair trial. Now, we've prepared submissions to the Minister of Justice saying this is unjust and oppressive and you ought never to surrender a Canadian to those circumstances, to such a trial. But the history of appealing to the Minister in these cases has not been a happy one. And these are political decisions, and it's very unlikely that Canada, through its current government and Minister of Justice, is going to tell the French, we're not going to send them to you because we think you'll run an unfair trial. The politics are, are, are sort of dominate the decision making at that point. So intelligence is evidence. The second is, when can expert evidence be used as a basis for extradition, and if it's sought to be, as it was in this case, it's expert evidence is an opinion, somebody's opinion. Uh, when is it, when, when and how can it be challenged? And this is where our judge, we felt, went really wrong. He felt, well, you can't do it by calling other experts. Well, you certainly can't challenge a handwriting opinion by calling a baker or a policeman, or, you know, a pilot, you'd have to call other experts in the field. And our judge said, well, I'm not a trial judge. They tell me in extradition I'm not allowed to weigh these competing experts. But he missed the point about you have to make a judgment of if there's even <coughs> threshold reliability. And he essentially found there wasn't here. Uh, so that'll be a key factor in this appeal. Not only can you use it, but how do you demonstrate its manifest unreliability? Then in this case, there is an issue that arose that we were fortunate to be able to demonstrate that the intelligence has actually been manipulated here. Because we found another version a month before, given by the same French juge d'instruction, the investigating judge, to another Canadian court, where he claimed the intelligence was just the opposite of what they're telling the intelligence was in, in Hassan's extradition case. And to the other court, they said, the 1999 intelligence from secret sources said 
these terrorists had come into France uh, from Spain by train <coughs> using their real passports and only reverted to using false passports on the ground in France. And therefore, Hassan Diab's passport would be indelible evidence of his participation. Because in those days, it's not like now in Europe, back in 1980, you got stamped uh, at all of these border crossings. The problem was Hassan's passport proved his innocence. He was never in France. So a month later, they changed the intelligence claim to the Canadian court, our court, and said the intelligence from 1999 said the terrorists came in using false passports. They turned Hassan's evidence that proved his innocence into evidence that was consistent with their intelligence. They made an exculpatory passport into a piece of inculpatory corroborative evidence. Um, so I should add one other thing that this case raises, and that's the crushing <coughs> financial burden to an ordinary Canadian of fighting a case when you're essentially fighting two massive governments and their wealth. Um, there's simply a total mismatch of resources here. So the ordinary person really is at pains to be able to fight this battle. I'm just reading Conrad Black's book of his account of his own legal endeavors and even he was through seizure of property. You know, his many millions were reduced down, so he was having trouble fighting the battle. His lawyers wanted a $25 million retainer. Well, our firm worked for the last year and a half for nothing because otherwise Hassan couldn't make the battle. He simply couldn't go around the world. We had to pay the experts. The money had to go somewhere, the little money that we could raise. And so we made the decision it was more important to have the experts and the evidence to get a record created of what this case was really about. But you can imagine how crushing it is financially to be able to try to keep fighting this battle now about to enter its fourth year against the resources of France, who every time we expose their case as, as tissue thin and uh, fabricated, they simply replay, they disavow it and they come up with somebody new. Um, so those are issues that the case raises about fundamental justice, about fair trial, about the kind of material we're willing to use as evidence in Canada and allow Canadians to go to face abroad. Now the fair trial concerns in France, I think you can already see. They will use this intelligence that's unanswerable. Human Rights Watch has written extensively about this. Uh, the International uh, Jurist Commission has written about this. Uh, the UK Home Office uh, studied the French system and rejected it as manifestly unfair but it will be used against Hassan if the French can get him there. Secondly, all of this handwriting, the two, the two farcical first handwriting people, and the third, and I haven't really got into how unreliable this third person is. Uh, she used, uh, uh, we, we called a Canadian, an American, and a British expert. We have since added to that with one of Europe's leading experts they all say the same thing. This particular woman that France found has no idea of the proper methodology to do a handwriting comparison. And that's the kind of material they're desperately trying to hang this uh, extradition on to get this man to France, where if he gets to France, I've been told by our lawyer in Paris, he really hasn't a chance. The, the intelligence will convict him, and that's the end of the matter, and we won't see Hassan again as a free man. So there is a real fair trial issue both about the use of intelligence as evidence that nobody can defend against and the use of evidence that we've demonstrated in Canada and through the world's leading experts is clearly unreliable. Uh, they will parachute back in the discredited 
handwriting, join it up with the latest handwriting, despite its use of the wrong methodology, and uh, despite all the experts that we've called, because in the French system, if the juge doesn't put it into the dossier, the reports of these other people, the trial court won't consider it. The juge is the, 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 the conduit through which evidence reaches the trial court. Well, of course, the juge is not. It's the same man who wrote up this story uh, against Hassan and changed and manipulated the intelligence. He's not about to blow up his own case by including the evidence of all these international experts. That's the kind of case that Hassan is going to face, and that's why his battle is important. Um, the author of the leading Canadian text on extradition law calls it Gary Botting, it's a professor at the <coughs> University of Victoria, um, calls it the least fair law in Canada. And even among its type, this case is among the worst cases in Canadian history of the use of unreliable, un indefensible material to attack a citizen's liberty and send him abroad to a hopelessly unfair trial. So that's that's the, the, the nitty-gritty of what's going on in Hassan's case. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll move on to Natalie, and then after that we'll have questions. So uh, I'll take a different uh, tack a little bit. I, uh, I'm here as the general counsel of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, which is a non-profit organization that uh, will intervene in cases uh, when it thinks that uh, the way in which uh, it raises, uh, in which it is being prosecuted and so on, raises issues that are even bigger than, than the case at stake. So my point will be certainly, uh, Mr. Diab is represented very ably by, uh, by a wonderful counsel, what can somebody from the outside contribute? And why is it that this case should be looked at? So I'm not going to talk so much about the unfairness to Mr. Uh, uh, Diab because, uh, Dr. Diab, because you know, we've heard a lot about this, and I think uh, very compellingly so. I'll talk a little bit about what is it that this case, what could we say about this case, about what it raises in terms of issues of Canadian law more generally, and international law, which will be a little bit the two points that uh, CCLA, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, will want to bring forward. The, uh, the idea of having uh, groups that are not linked, and, you know, we maintain our independence, that are not linked to the, the case, uh, but to come in uh, to say, from the outside, we're saying, watch out because this is not right. You know, we're speaking on behalf of, uh, of uh, uh, all our members who are concerned about civil liberties generally, the rule of law, and so on. So trying to bring in, to come in at a more general level as opposed to a more particular level. So this is what I'm going to talk about, is uh, what this case shows for Canadian law, the future of Canadian law, and uh, and uh, international law, and why indeed I think it's it certainly is a case where the judge got it wrong, and that will be our, our position. So it's not it's not going to be as as uh, heart wrenching and, uh, and and a little bit uh, uh, less. Uh, so all my apologies for not mentioning you know honing in on all the unfairness and talking a little bit more broadly. So the position I think that, that we have to take is to recognize also, and that's what we always do, is to recognize what are the interests at play here. So I'll start a little bit by talking about what is it that, why is it this case, how come with such a good counsel you haven't won yet? You know? uh, so why, why is it a difficult case and what are the pressures that will be uh, that were on the on uh, Justice Maranger and will be on the Court of Appeal. Okay. And the, the two principles, I think, that are uh, on the other side that have to be uh, confronted are the first principle that they call committee uh, uh, nation, which is a, 
you know, an old principle that says, essentially, we're not going to tell other countries how to run their justice system. They won't come and tell us how to run their justice, uh, to run our justice system, so we're not going to tell other countries how to run their justice system. So it's a, it's a little bit of a principle of non-ingérence, you know, we're not going to, uh, 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 you know, it's, it's a little bit the principle that has founded uh, the entire international law, you know, nations are sovereigns, they do their own thing internally, and then, uh, you know, butt out, uh, don't come and tell us how to how to uh, run our country? So that's a principle that's that's here that we have to tackle and put limits around. And that's I think will be one of uh, a job to do. The second principle that I think is at stake here is it's not only because of uh, the war on terror. There is a general movement to say we have to cooperate internationally to bring to justice people who would have committed serious crimes no matter where they are in the world. So they are, and you know, and there are this, this movement to say, well, they may be out there war criminals, they may be out there people that have committed uh, genocides and so on, so we need to have a system, and it's called the extradition, where we can find people wherever they are in the world and bring them to the justice where indeed they have the, the, the evidence is. So these two principles are kind of the obstacles. Now, CCLA's position is fine and well, everybody agrees with this, those are good principles, but wrong processes, processes that are unfair, do not help the cause. Wrong processes, processes that are unfair, do not help respect for uh, <coughs> bringing people to justice. They, knew they do not help the principle of respecting uh, the independence of other countries or the sovereignty of other countries. Getting the wrong person does not help the fight against terrorism either. You know, it will mean the file is closed and, you know, it's, it's, not, it, it's, not, uh, it's not a good thing for the pursuit of justice. So the, the position will be that Taking seriously the issue of unfairness is not to undermine the, the fight for justice, ensuring that there's accountability in this world, that if people commit serious uh, uh, wrongs, that, you know, that they are brought to justice somewhere, somehow, eventually. It's not that. It's about insisting that doing it, doing it the right way, is the best guarantee of justice. So, and I'll talk, so that's, those will be a little bit the gist of the position, is to accept that these principles exist, that they're not wrong, but that they should not drive the entire agenda. That fairness is, after all, at the essence of achieving these purposes. So, the two arguments I think that we're coming to, uh, to make are, will be twofold. The first one will be to say, when, uh, as people have said, when Justice Maranger said something like, uh, the fact that I'm, a, you know, and I'm, I'm quoting him, allow me to say that the case presented by the Republic of France against Mr. Diab is a weak case. The prospect of a conviction in the context of a fair trial seem unlikely. However, it matters not that I hold this view. We will be there to challenge the last sentence, which <coughs> is to say that it does matter uh, that he holds this view. It does matter that indeed the Canadian justice system looking at this evidence saying in no way if the, the case was brought in Canadian law would it lead to a conviction. A conviction. And, you know, I, that's what he says. He says if I was, you know, <laughs> if this case was being tried here, uh, it'd be dismissed. This is a this is important, okay? And the reason why we're going to say this is we're going to say, when Canada says that, says this is bad evidence, this is no good, this is not good enough, it does not say uh, to, uh, it says to France, do your homework right, you know, do a better homework. It raises the level internationally of what is fairness and justice. So we're going to try to say here, 
it's not about it's it's important that if the standards of justice that are in that that are applied in Canada are uh, important and represent what fairness is, it's not a disservice to the Committee of Nations, it's not a disservice <coughs> to uh, fighting the good fight, it is a service to it to insist that there's good evidence. So that's, uh, you know, it's the way in which you try to, to, to insist upon raising the standards of evidence is not against justice. It's in fact for justice. It ensures that the right people are found uh, uh, to be responsible and not the wrong one, which is indeed uh, a pretty basic principle. So we'll talk a little. So that's that's how we're going to handle, or that's you know one alignment. And I have to say, there there, you know, I'm not tonight saying that I'm not committing to. We may find other arguments until the case gets to uh, to to be heard. But at this stage, I think we're aligning ourselves. We're trying to uh, to challenge. This idea that extradition law in Canada is simply uh, uh, a rubber stamp, uh, that it does not demand on the Canadian justice system to infuse any sense of fairness and justice, we will see this is a disservice to the, the enterprise of justice uh, uh, around the world. So that's, that's, that's the first point. The second point will be to deal with these questions of intelligence versus evidence. It is uh, of concern, I think, to um, everyone that uh, this move to accept intelligence and evidence be spread around the world. It is not only a question of whether or not, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's an unfair practice, it makes no sense. It undermines the right to a fair trial. It also undermines other international commitment, which are the conventions against torture. Because if you don't know what evidence, uh, what what uh, intelligence is being is being used, it could very well be that some of this uh, intelligence was obtained under torture, and therefore, by participating and by accepting this, uh, you are undermining the international commitment uh, uh, on the Convention Against Torture, which is to say torture is wrong. Everybody that touches it has a duty to remove it and stop it. You know, it's not a just to look the other way. If you see it, if you know it, you not only cannot use it, but you're, you have a positive duty to stop it. So. The, the idea that, that here um, the, there's a potential for intelligence to be used uh, in this context undermines a fundamental uh, commitment of Canada in the Convention Against Torture. One of the points I think that also will be made, because I think it's important, will be to make it matters not which country it is. Now it's France. It could be the US. It could be Libya. It could be any country. And we should not distinguish. We should, all countries can make mistakes. We've made mistakes in the way in which we've, we've prosecuted people. We have a record in Canada where people have been uh, wrongfully convicted. You know, so we cannot presume that because it's a Western country with whom we have good ties, that they will not make a mistake. You know, indeed, it's important to look at the evidence and and be the watchdog. You know, the extradition process may indeed prevent injustice by by doing the its right role, which is to prevent the hysteria that may come. In this case, you you could just imagine how you know having you know, found the person who may have been responsible for a horrible thing that happened in 1980 is heralded as being, you know, you know, a victory for the intelligence services, heralded as a victory for policing, and, and, and there's lots of, of emotions around this. You could just imagine all the communities that were affected are just, you know, uh, are not completely objective about what's going on, you know. Uh, they are, 
indeed uh, probably absolutely uh, 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 frightened uh, that indeed there will not be any ending to this. So, so it's helpful to have a process outside of the country that looks at it and says, your evidence is just not good enough. It's bad. It doesn't work. <coughs> so, the, so as you see, the, the, the position is therefore to uh, say, no matter which country it is, no matter which person it is, objectively, this is bad law for Canada. Certainly, I think we would not want uh, a Canadian to be subjected to, to this now or ever again. You know, injustice to one person is an affront to us all. But more than that, it's an affront to justice across the world. You know, if you give up now, you have accepted that you know, there will continue to be intelligence using torture that, that will be used in evidence. You will accept that you know, bad trials, unfair trials, are, are, are going to go on and Canada will lose a leadership position you know, that I would say the extradition gives it. Now, there's, there are some good language, I think, in some of the cases at the Supreme Court that seems to say that, uh, that uh, um, you know, it's not a rubber stamp. And, and, uh, and uh, there, you know, certainly I think uh, there's a way in which to respect a, a, a committee of nation by still insisting on fairness and that it's not wrong to do so. There may also be, I think, an opportunity to reflect on new ways of addressing this this idea. I mean, you know, the 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 court has imposed conditions uh, on extradition uh, against the U.S. It does impose the conditions that they ought not to use the death penalty, for example. So it has, you know, recognized that extradition is a moment of truth where you can exercise some. Uh, I would describe it as some vision of what appropriate justice is and ought to be internationally and impose some conditions. So there may be an opportunity here to talk about the unreliability, the danger of using uh, intelligence as opposed to <coughs> evidence and to rely on poor, potentially fabricated uh, evidence just to uh, feed the machine. And I would just want, I'm going to end on, on one final note, which is the transformation of the <coughs> intelligence report. You know, an intelligence report that comes one way and then suddenly, now this is not new. It has happened in Canada as well, uh, where, and courts are becoming, I think, more and more uh, cognizant of the fact that outside of having better processes, they can be lied to. You know, and indeed, I think we have evidence that, that they have, at times they have been lied to. So this, I think, is, is, a, is important to, for the court to recognize <coughs> that it has a duty to search for the truth, because otherwise we all are at, at in danger of, of losing this the ability for the truth to be known. So this fight, it seems to me, is certainly about justice for one man, but it's also about ensuring truth for other people and ensuring the preservation of the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. For your